And there is excitement in the air tonight here at Kellogg Middle School in Rochester. A prime time debate on the issues that matter most to you here in this hotly contested first congressional district race. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Overly. Thank you for joining us tonight. And a big thank you to the great crowd we have here tonight as well on this rather wet uh, evening tonight. We are asking questions posed by you and our uh, question ask askers are KTTC's Caitlin Alexander and Jess Abrahamson as well. They are getting them on index cards from people here and others that you mail emailed to us earlier. So let's get down to business. Dan Fian is the nominee for the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Jim Agador, the Republican nominee. Thank you both for being here tonight. And by order of uh, a coin flip, uh, Dan, you are going to open with the uh, opening statement, so go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks to the crowd that's with us here tonight, and thank you to KTTC as well. Uh, my name is Dan Fian, and I am running to represent Southern Minnesota in Congress. I grew up in Red Wing. I live in North Mankato now, and I grew up with a sense of what our community is. It's a place where people take care of each other. It's a place, place where people help each other. In spite of any disagreements you might have, that's the reality of life. You still have that spirit of service of giving back. And I've tried to live my life by that. I served two combat tours in Iraq after I witnessed 9-11 uh, and the terror attacks in Washington, D.C. Searching for roadside bombs, trying to capture insurgents, and you learn a lot about what the stakes of real leadership are. When I got back to the United States, I became a middle school teacher. And I learned that the, the challenges between middle schoolers and soldiers, uh, there's, there's a lot in common there, but you also learn the importance of being there for people, of taking care of people. And those experiences taught me, most importantly, that a leader can have an impact, even in the toughest of circumstances. But it also taught me that in spite of disagreements, you have to work together to get things done. And I'm running for Congress in the place that gave me that value of service because we have big challenges here in Southern Minnesota. We have a healthcare system that is failing too many people both with its cost, both with its accessibility, and the fact that a lot of people still don't have health care today. We have big challenges in our economy, where we're told the economy is strong, but every day I talk to people working two or three jobs, working hard to make ends meet because the costs of life are growing greater and greater. And we have a very much a sense of fear. There's a sense of chaos in what is a broken Washington, D.C. And I'm running for Congress not just to represent stability in the sense of chaos, but to make sure a check and balance goes to Washington, D.C. when we need it the most. You're going to hear a lot of partisan talking points today, but not from me, because I don't believe that's what's needed in Washington, D.C. You need a voice that's going to represent all Southern Minnesotans, and that's why I'm running in the first place. All right, Mr. Uh, Fian, thank you very much. Mr. Hagedorn, you're next. Hi, I'm Jim Hagedorn, Republican candidate for Congress here in the 1st District. I'm a product of this district here in Southern Minnesota. Born in Blue Earth, where I reside today. Raised on a grain and livestock farm just outside of Truman. My father, grandfather, and great-grandfather are all Southern Minnesota farmers. My father, Tom Hagedorn, was a congressman here many years ago. And this has always been home one way or the other because these are my roots. Now, our campaign's going very well. We won the primary recently by a pretty good margin. Our competitor called to congratulate us, Carla Nelson. We, we thank her for her service. And we're a united party moving forward. Matter of fact, we're very united. Just last week, President Donald Trump visited Rochester to boost our campaign, to campaign with us. We appreciate the President's visit. It was a wonderful, energizing time for all. As we move forward, this election offers us uh, two opportunities, two worldviews. One is that uh, the other team, the Democrat Party, they want to take back power. And they want to resist, they want to replace, and they want to move us far to the left. I'm on the other side. I want to keep partnering with President Trump and like-minded people in the U.S. House, keep moving our country in what I'd say is the right direction. Tonight we're going to talk about many issues. I will offer you solutions to the problems and challenges facing America and Southern Minnesota. I will be honest with you and let you know exactly where I stand. The other day in Otana we had a debate. My opponent, well, he didn't quite tell too many people exactly where he stood. He talked a lot, but he didn't quite say anything tonight. I hope we can have a robust uh, discussion of the issues, and we can let you, in the end, know exactly where we're coming from and what we want to do with this job. Thank you. All right, thank you both for joining us. So let's start on bipartisanship. That's the first question. What are you both doing to reach beyond your base of supporters to demonstrate that you can be a leader who represents a broad spectrum of opinions and interests, and we'll begin with you, Mr. 
Well, I think if you want to represent Southern Minnesota, you have to represent the uh, interests of all of Southern Minnesota. Primarily, the three drivers in the economy are medical care, which is very important, especially here in Rochester, small business and manufacturing, and then agriculture. You know, I, I learned a long time ago when I worked for a Minnesota congressman named Arlen Stanglin. He was on the Agriculture Committee, and what I learned is this. You're going to work with Republicans and Democrats, and you're going to work with people who are interested in agriculture from all around the world. You know, we have to get along with cotton farmers and other farmers. Maybe we don't do that in our district, but we want all of agriculture to do well and move forward. So, you know, I've understood that lesson. Another is when I was an executive in the Treasury Department, I went up on Capitol Hill and moved bills <coughs> with both parties. Steny Hoyer, who's a second, second in charge in the Democrat House, uh, and the Democrats in the House, he's one of the people that uh, co-sponsored and sponsored legislation that I put out there. And so I've never had a problem moving up and working in a bipartisan fashion to get things done. But in the House of Representatives, it's an institution put together by the forefathers that operates on sheer power. One vote, more than half, they control all the committees, all the debate, and pretty much the bills that go to the Senate. And it's a, it's a big choice for the people. You know, the Democrats are gonna, are gonna take that place over and are gonna give us a lot of things that I don't think are good for Southern Minnesota. And Dan, I believe in his views, will misrepresent you on those things. I, I would be on the other side that would work with the Republicans to keep working with the president, to keep the economy rolling, to deregulate, to protect us and, and have a strong defense, to protect our God-given rights. There's a, there's a big difference between the two parties right now. We just have clear, different world views. Okay, Mr. Hagedorn, thank you. Mr. Field. Absolutely. Washington, D.C. is broken uh, because of partisanship and because uh, people that are there, both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, are satisfied with simply just blaming the other side and going home, thinking that they achieved something. I don't represent that. I don't represent that because I know that the stakes of inaction in Washington, D.C. have life and death consequences on people. I learned that in war, I learned that in the classroom, and that is definitely what inaction in healthcare looks like right now, where healthcare has just gotten worse for us over the last two years. The approach that I take in bipartisanship is the same approach to leadership I've taken my whole life. I was a platoon leader of soldiers when I was 23 years old. That platoon was more diverse than this country is itself. We couldn't agree on much, but we still got things done in spite of it. When I worked in the Pentagon, my approach to making policy was to take my ideas and go to the person first I knew would disagree with me. Because then I knew we could build a real relationship and I could learn what wasn't so great about my ideas along the way. That's the same approach to bipartisanship that is needed in Washington, D.C. And that's the approach that I'm going to take. But it's not just about what you are going to say, it's what you're actually going to do. We've tried to do service projects throughout this campaign, and people give me grief about that. Why is, it, why is someone running for office doing service projects? Because I think in 2018, it is critical to remind each other how much we do rely on each other. We just did one at Silver Lake Park this past Saturday here in Rochester. The geese still do control the park, but we were able to do up a, a lot of cleaning there along the way. But the invitation was the same as it was for the previous 10 times before that. I don't care if you voted, I don't care who you voted for, we have to come to recognize each other's humanity. And my intent to take an oath of office if I'm lucky enough to get elected. That oath is not to any party leader, it's not to any corporate special interest, it's to support and defend the Constitution. I know that oath well because it's the same oath I took as an Army officer, and it's the same approach to leadership I would have if elected. All right, thank you. We're going to give you a one-minute rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Hagedorn, do you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I would just say I think the best way to show that you're going to do your best to represent all the people is to show up in the communities and get to know people as best as possible and find out what folks are thinking. That's what we've done. We've made hundreds and hundreds of stops across the district. We've done some Main Street campaigning, walked 350 miles of parades. That's like starting in South Dakota, going all the way to Scotts and crisscrossing I-90 the whole way, and coming back here to Rochester. And then we sat down with people, thought leaders across our district. Could be uh, city administrators, could be social leaders, sheriffs, police, others, to find out what's going on in the community. So if and when we were to win the election, we'd be in a good position to, uh, to work with people and get started and, and help people in their communities, all the different 21 counties. And so I'd just say that the best way you can show that you're gonna be fair and representative is to keep an open mind, keep open ears, and uh, meet the people directly. And that's what I've done. That's what our campaign's done these last two years. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finn. Sure. Look, this, this is a, a topic where you already start to hear the language of division that our country doesn't need right now. The idea of the other team. I mean, it, last time I checked, we are one team in this country. At least that's the idea that your leaders have to represent. 
And while the president did visit the district last week, uh, we spent some time door knocking here in Rochester because I believe there were far more people in their homes that night. And I found people on every aisle of the spectrum because it's important to remember when we talk about bipartisanship right now, there are a lot of people in this country and in this southern Minnesota who feel they don't have a party right now. You have to acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge that's the byproduct of one side just pitted against the other constantly, election cycle after election cycle. Southern Minnesota deserves a different type of politics that makes sure that our politics is public service at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. So now it's time for questions from you, the viewers. We will work very hard to keep track, of course, and rotate uh, questions between the candidates after they have time for a rebuttal. And Caitlin, okay, we'll start with you. Okay, we'd like to thank all of our viewers who not only filled out cards tonight with their questions, but who emailed in their questions to us ahead of time as well. So I'd, I'd like to thank Dave Amundsen from Rochester for this question. What is your vision for protecting Social Security and Medicare? Dave says senior citizens have paid into those programs for many years and now depend on them. I believe Mr. Hagedorn responded first last time, so Mr. Dean will go first this time. I, every day I hear people worry about the future of what they have worked their entire lives uh, to earn. And that's just it, it's an idea of earning it. So the idea that we're even talking about these things, Social Security, Medicare being at risk, should give you pause. Because it's important to look at what's happened over the last two years. We have grown our deficit enormously as a country after a tax reform bill that was directly meant to support the top earners in this country. And the next step of that is to start questioning these programs that people have spent their entire lives paying into and earning. And that's something I will not accept. We need tax reform in this country, but it's to be directly for working people and should not put our social programs at jeopardy, in jeopardy. I'm someone who believes that Social Security can become solvent, and there are great ways to be able to do that. I'm someone that believes that our Medicare programs have to be strengthened and expanded so that they're actually comprehensive enough to cover the ails that people have in, our, in their lives. Things like dental, vision, mental health. Those things are things you have my commitment that will absolutely protect and make sure that they are not just strong, but they are for my children and, the, and my children's children along the way. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hagedor? Well, first and foremost, a promise made is a promise kept. People paid into those programs. People need to be reimbursed and get their money back and then some. And the promises need to be kept. I, I always hear, you know, they're running commercials against me. Hagedor wants to take away Social Security want to protect it. There are ideas on the table that we can use. We could have, for instance, people, uh, the government and other people paying into a system when somebody's born. So they can grow money all the way through their lives and have even more than they probably would have under this social security system. And that would be pretty fair for the younger people who are starting out. We can let people who are affluent to buy out. So maybe they don't expend as many taxpayer dollars and reimbursements. Those are ideas. We can talk about those. But by and large, if you want to if you want to solve these, uh, keep these programs solvent, we do have to address the debt. I was one of the few Republicans in the country, I'll admit it, in real time that said I didn't like it when President Bush and Republicans doubled the national debt from five to ten trillion dollars. I didn't think that was a good idea. I really didn't think it was a good idea when Barack Obama's president doubled it from ten trillion to twenty trillion. And now I think we're spending too much as well. And the problem is now. Interest rates are ratcheting up. Our interest payments on the debt are going up two and threefold. Where are we getting the money? And that's what this debt is what really threatens Social Security and these programs. We need to reform government. We need to grow the economy. The reason they had that tax cut bill was to try to grow the economy. But we do need individual tax reform. I agree with that. In the end, uh, the best way I think that we can solve the problem and protect the people is to make sure we have a fiscal, fiscally responsible government. I'd be somebody to reform government to cut costs. I'd do that in Washington as your congressman. Okay, thank you. You have a minute. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, something just took out to me, this idea of where, where do we get the money from? Uh, well, at the same time, being okay with the tax reform bill uh, that has been passed over the last two years. We, we have made a situation worse by putting programs at jeopardy and, and having to ask this question of where are we going to get the money from within the first place. I don't buy that. I don't buy the idea that people who are working their entire lives now have to face that question of, is what I've earned going to be there when I need it most? And that's a self-inflicted wound from the current administration. That's a part that I don't see benefiting Southern Minnesotans directly. Mr. Negador, a minute. Well, during the Obama administration, we never had over 3% growth. The economy was stagnant. People were in trouble. And uh, it's gotten better since President Trump's taken over. The market's up. That's what, that creates a lot of wealth. 
the, the tax bill was designed to try to bring monies back from overseas. Some of that's happened. A lot of those tax reform uh, monies have been passed along, for instance, to utility uh, users from uh, from Congress. And uh, many, many Minnesotans, especially in this crowd and others, are reaping some rewards from the, from the tax bill. Do I agree that we need more individual tax reform so people can save, spend, invest, and hold their own money the way they see fit, not the Washington politicians, the interest groups, and the bureaucrats? Absolutely, and that would be something that I would work on as your member of Congress. Thank you, Chair. This is a question from a member of our audience, and Mr. Hagedorn, if you would answer it first. Do you believe that global climate change is happening? And if so, what would you do as a congressman to combat it? Well, I believe that the Earth has been heating and cooling since God created. And I, I do not believe, well, I, I see we have some skeptics here, whether or not God created it. But uh, I believe that the Earth has been heating and cooling since God created. I believe that uh, based upon what I've seen, the proposals out there and so forth, there's nothing to combat it in such a way that it's going to solve the problem. What the, what the left proposes and what they wanted to do with things like the Paris Climate Accords, the cap and trade, the clean power plan, is force us to pay dramatically higher electricity, fuel, and other rates, other costs, in order and transform our economy. And I don't think that was in the best interest of the people, the economy, and our, our way of life. So what I believe is this, we should have energy independence, and we should have an all of the above approach. If there are uh, energy sources that are cleaner, better, more efficient, bring them on. I'm all for that. But let's do it in an efficient way and let's not force consumers and businesses in our economy to suffer. I also think we need the pipelines, the distribution plant at points, and the refineries in order to efficiently utilize the energy resources we have in the United States. And they are vast, more than any other nation in the world. And finally, the ultimate goal has to be reliable, abundant, affordable U.S. energy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finn. So I'd first like to address the premise of the question. I, I don't accept the premise of the question, and I think that's an important point to recognize. This is not a matter of belief. The question should cut off that first part and go right to the second. What are you going to do to mitigate the impacts of climate change, period? Because it's not some reality on some far-flung shore or on our own nation's soil. It's a reality here in southern Minnesota. Travel to southeast Minnesota right now. Check out where Hoka Falls was, when I say was, because it's not there anymore. We've seen an increased amount of rain over the past couple of years. We've seen a fluctuation of temperatures that impacts our ag economy here. We've seen thousand year storms happen repeatedly in a time span that is not a thousand years. The impacts are here. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? And how are you going to take advantage of the opportunity we have as Southern Minnesotans to harness the energies that we have here, like solar and wind and make sure we are leaders here. I have a vision here where in Southern Minnesota, we can become energy independent here. Think about that where we don't have to be reliant on foreign oil, something we are still reliant on today. And we can make sure that the best use of our energy, think about the U.S. military. The U.S. military has viewed climate change as a national security threat since the 70s. And it could be an incredible platform in which we can develop the technology that could benefit all of us. The U.S. Navy is trying to become energy independent with renewable energy for the last nine years. And that's an example of something that we can do to make sure the technology continues to develop and while promoting solar and wind industries here at home so that we can become leaders on this issue rather than debating what is a foregone fact at this point. Thank you. We have one more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the problem is we can't be energy independent in southern Minnesota. We're part of a nation that relies on many, many different energy sources. The only form of energy that we're relying upon foreign sources is crude oil. And that's going to, we're going to be needing crude oil for quite some time. I told you what, the flat out what my position was. I gave you my energy positions, let you know what I want to do with the job. But does Dan, what's he want to do about climate change? He tells us it's a problem. He doesn't tell us what he wants to do. Does he support the clean power plan? Does he support the ban on fracking? Does he support the Paris Accords? Does he support cap and trade? What does he support? Here's an example here in which I can offer a rebuttal right now. That's, that's an opportunity I have right now. But again, this isn't a question of debate. This is a question of what you're going to do about it. And it's not just a question of what we're going to do about it, but the idea that we had an opportunity as a country to do something about it holistically. So we're at the point right now 
where one congressional district has a chance to take advantage of an opportunity to become a leader in clean energy right now and to make sure that we are not reliant on foreign energy as we are right now around the world. I don't accept that. That's a national security threat in my view. And so what Congress could do at this point is to make sure we are doing everything to make up for the fact that our country is doing nothing at this point to combat climate change. Okay, very good. Thank you. No answer. We received this question from uh, countless people, many people writing today. Uh, your comments on sanctuary cities and states and withholding federal funding for those who are not in compliance. Uh, Mr. Fee, we'll have you go first. We have a broken immigration system. No matter what side of the political spectrum you happen to fall on, I find vast agreement with that idea. And these are, these are buzzwords that like to come up because when our immigration system is broken, it's on the backs of law enforcement, it's on the backs of states, and it's on the backs of local mayors to figure out what to do about it in the first place. So I don't accept the idea that that's, that has to become the status quo. I believe it is a bipartisan notion that comprehensive immigration reform can be a reality in this country. And that starts simply. It, start, it starts with the needs we have here in southern Minnesota for labor. It starts with a guest worker program. It starts with DACA, making sure that Dreamers is, is a matter and function of law in this country. Those are bipartisan ideas that members of the pork producers agree on and members of the Democratic Party agree on. There is room for agreement here that we can make that a reality. I don't accept the fact that this has to become a debate of what to do with the broken system. I think we should fix it. And now my opponent here in a second is going to talk about the concept of border security. And as someone who has spent a long time in national security doing whatever it takes to keep this country safe, I would welcome that as a conversation. But I reject the premise that this is a separate compre conversation from comprehensive immigration reform. I'm happy to have both conversations, but I'm not ha happy to have one as a trade-off for the other. Because the threats facing this country have far more to do than what's happening at our southern border. They are advanced, and they take many different forms. And if we want to have that conversation, I'd love to have it. I would love to talk to the President of the United States about that conversation, to enlighten him about what the threats are facing this country. Because I don't think right now he's taking very good advice around the table. Because at the end of the day, we have to do what it takes to keep this country safe. That has never been a questioned idea. But I have a, I have a hunch that in a second someone's going to question that. I, again, don't accept that. Our country can be safe and we can have comprehensive immigration reform because that's what our economy needs right here, to, to address the labor challenges that we have in southern Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. I believe your question was, do I support sanctuary cities and would I vote to defund them? I do not support sanctuary cities. Yeah. I do not support sanctuary cities. Tim Walls is running on making Minnesota a sanctuary state, which will bring in illegal aliens from a 10-state region, draw them in, increase our crime, and keep, increase our costs. It's a, it's a ridiculous idea. And so, no, I don't support it, and we should be funded. The, the situation with the border has been going on for, what, 30 years, ever since Reagan? We haven't, we haven't addressed it. We finally had a guy run for president that said we should fix it. And he's trying to do that, whether it's building a wall or putting up fences, having merit-based immigration to make sure it makes sense, fixing the passport visa system so when people fly into our country and overstay their visas, like many of them did on 9-11, that we round them up and get them the heck out of the country like every other country around the world. We should protect the American people from crime, from people who should not be in the United States. We should protect the American worker from depressed wages, from people who should not be in the United States. In the end, though, do I support? I always have a work program so people can come into the United States and fill needed jobs, but it's done in a verifiable way by the government. And people could leave and come as they please or build up credits towards citizenship. You know, the United States is the most generous country in the world as far as legal immigration is concerned. We bring in over a million people every year. We're the best people on earth when it comes to that. All we're saying and what I'm saying is, let's do it in a merit-based way so we know who's here that we know who's gonna fill jobs that are needed, and to make sure that we have some semblance of, of hope that they're going to assimilate and contribute to the overall economy and be good for the citizens who are already part of the fabric of America. Yeah, I, I think it is important to, to point out that uh, my opponent's not running against uh, Tim Walz. 
Uh, that was the last two times he ran for Congress. So that's that's an important distinction to point out here. Uh, my, my perspective on immigration is informed by everything I just laid out, but it's also informed by the fact that my own Irish ancestors immigrating to Plainview and Janesville and being able to find opportunity where they came without questioning uh, and without making them live in the shadows along the way. And that's, that's an opportunity that I believe can continue for America. Every restricted policy of immigration is going to set us backwards because it has an impact far greater than the policy itself. And at the end of the day, we are in a strong economy now that depends on people being at the heart of it, that drive it. And if we are no longer a welcoming place for people to come to, then our economy will suffer on account of it. I understand we welcome a million people a year. That's pretty good. And I, I would say this, that uh, when is ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, when are those people supposed to do their jobs? When are they supposed to deport people who are here illegally? I believe they should do their jobs. I support them. Law enforcement has endorsed me, the Fraternal Order of Police and others, because of my positions on these issues. But Dan won't be honest with you and tell you whether or not he supports sanctuary politics. When should ICE deport people? I asked him the other day in the debate. He won't answer. He doesn't give you concrete uh, positions on what he wants to do with the job. I'm being open and honest with you and letting you know exactly where I stand, exactly how I would represent you in the Congress. And as far as whether or not our ancestors, my ancestors came here from Germany. But you know what? A third of the people that came here uh, in those days left because they couldn't make it. But right now we have a welfare system where people can come to the United States and do better on our welfare system than they can working full time in their home countries. That's not a good recipe. And that's why we want people to be able to assimilate and we want to have some certainty in that. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Midway through this debate, we're going to take a brief break. We will be right back and let's give our two candidates. First congressional district uh, district debate between Jim Hagedorn and Dan Feehan. And again, we appreciate the great crowd we have here tonight as well. So I'm going to kick off uh, this second half of the debate with this question it is uh, about guns and law enforcement. What can we do to increase police safety, reduce crime, and prevent wrongful civilian deaths by law enforcement authorities? And uh, I believe on this time we are starting with you, Mr. Hagedorn. Yeah, it's, that's a very good question, and, I, and here's the deal. Uh, we've been going across the district, all 21 counties, meeting with sheriffs and police officers and others, talking about this uh, very question. And uh, unfortunately, to a person, they tell me that respect for law enforcement and people who cooperated with the police, you know, do the right thing, it went right down the tubes at Ferguson. They said it was the next day, when the president made that speech and those talks, that was it, you can draw a line. And now our police and law enforcement officers are having a hard time filling slots. They used to get 20, maybe 30, 40 good qualified people. Now they might get a handful. And so it's put a lot of pressure on law enforcement. On top of that, the needs in our communities are changing and we're asking our police officers to function in many different ways. Now in many ways they're, they're, they're social workers. They're people that have to deal with illicit drugs that can kill them if they touch them. There's all sorts of mental health issues that are permeating through our communities. And it's not just the big cities, it's all of them, small cities and in between. And so I think the first, first and foremost, what we need to do is we need to cooperate with the police. When the police give an order, cooperate with that police officer. Don't put them under pressure. And then in return, what we ask from our police officers is that they receive the proper training, that they're open to whatever types of changes need to be made, and that when somebody does make a mistake, and it happens, that they be prosecuted to the full extent of the, extent of the law, and maybe even a little more because they do it under the color of law, and that we, we stand for justice for all. But it's a, it's, a, it's a situation I think all of us as individuals can make a difference. And I just, uh, again, say that I do respect and support our law enforcement, and I'm honored to have their endorsement. Thank you. Your thoughts on this, Mr. Flynn? Absolutely. 
I, I view policing in the same realm that I view the military. We ask a lot of them. In fact, we ask increasing amounts of things from both of them. And we're at the place, if you think about the U.S. military, that it's expected to be a jack of all trades, to be able to handle anything happening around the world. And I think that is happening to our law enforcement, too. And I thought my opponent and I were going we're gonna to reach the same conclusions on this, but this is a little bit of difference. I see our law enforcement having to take on the ills of mental health challenges in this country. I see them having to take on the challenges of overcriminalization, in particular of nonviolent drug offenses. And so when I think about the simplest things we can do to take away that burden of just expecting law enforcement to be that jack of all trades, we can take we can change our laws so that we are not overcriminalizing nonviolent drug offenses. We can increase funding into mental health so that actual mental health professionals can handle mental health challenges rather than a law enforcement. And if we were to change those two burdens alone on law enforcement, then we could address and focus on the training needed, both the training to keep them safe from a personal protective standpoint and make sure that they have the best technology that, that money can buy, but at the same time that they are trained to be community police officers at the end of the day, so they can focus on that task that we all need to keep us safe at the end of the day. But this is, in my view, about making sure the challenges that aren't policing challenges are actually addressed. Again, an issue in which Congress has failed to act to address mental health, for example, to address the overcriminalization of nonviolent drug offenses in our country. <coughs> and those are things that I would want to take on from Congress. Okay, do you, do you have anything you want to add? Just briefly, I mean, talking with law enforcement officers, uh, I don't know how much of this gets into legalizing drugs or legalizing marijuana, something that I said the other day I'm against, and again, Dan wouldn't give a position. But I can tell you this, that I, don't, I haven't met a police officer uh, sheriff or anybody who thinks that that's a good idea. Uh, the drugs today that are out there, especially marijuana, are like 10 times stronger than in the past. creates big problems. It is a gateway drug. And I think, you know, uh, for putting the law enforcement under pressure, uh, that's not something that we want to do. We're just going to have a lot, of, lot more people with a lot more problems. Tim. Yeah. Uh, similar to our, our last debate at Owatonna, these statements kind of stand out uh, for the lack of understanding they actually have of, of reality uh, today. And secondly, the law enforcement that I talk to is overburdened with taking on tasks that they shouldn't have to take on in the first place. And I think it is absolutely time to open the conversations as to whether the things that are made legal in this country, things like marijuana, for example, have to be that way going forward. Because that burden is on our law enforcement right now. And I, I gave my answer very clearly there. I am absolutely open to legalization of marijuana because it is far time for this country to look at that and the costs that come with criminalizing it in the first place. Okay, thank you. And Jesse Abramson, I believe you have the next question. Sure do. Someone in our audience tonight would like to know, do you believe the tariffs imposed by President Trump will adversely affect the agricultural economy? Also, what is your message for farmers who are struggling with low crop prices, low livestock prices, and low dairy prices? And this would be in the Yes, absolutely. Yes, I believe the escalating trade war uh, issued, begun by this president, is impacting our economy. It's not will, it's not a matter of will, it already is happening right now. As we're in the middle of a harvest that now is also made wet, and the challenges that our farmers have on their shoulders are only increasing over time. I talk to farmers from every aspect of our agriculture, our pork producers, our soy producers, our corn producers, and the message is the same. Please end this trade war. This is on our back. This is taking away the markets that those farmers opened up in the first place. And so my message to them is simple. You're going to find someone in me that is going to work just as hard as you are every single day to make sure that you are represented and at the table. And I think what we're working through right now in this trade war is the byproduct of a Congress that wasn't at the table and is not at the table in the middle of a trade war. And that's something that absolutely has to change. I don't buy the argument that Minnesotans, Southern Minnesotans, have to be the ones taking one for the team here. I don't buy the argument, as my opponent said at FarmFest, that they should just be patient. There is no room for patience in farming, especially a season like this. And every farmer, small and large, is I'm going to have their back if I have the chance to be elected. Okay, thank you. One well, minute. you know, President Trump ran on this issue, and he said China was ripping us off, manipulating its currency, had a big advantage over us, was stealing our intellectual property. And he said also Canada and Mexico to a degree, he wanted to reset the, the trade. And so people knew this was coming. Everybody understood that that was the president's uh, position. Now, am I somebody that believes in tariffs? No, I think tariffs are only good for the governments that impose them and the, and the industries that they try to protect. And usually there's a diminishing return. But in this case, and most of the farmers that I talked to, I'd say 95%, they get it. Something had to be done about China. Well, 
Obama didn't do anything. Bush didn't do anything. They were cleaning our clock, so we wanted to get them to the table. Well, we've seen progress. We already have an agreement with Mexico and Canada. Looks like a good agreement. Minnesota Farm Bureau, who endorsed me, said, hey, they like it. They think it's going to help farmers, especially the dairy farmers in our, in our area, because Canada had a 300% tariff, and now we're going to knock that down. In the end, what we're looking for is to knock down the barriers, expand our global markets to make sure that the farmers here in our district and elsewhere have, uh, have markets for the finest agricultural products in all the world. And this isn't a, bi you know, this isn't a partisan issue. I remember being at Farm Fest in 2016 debating Congressman Waltz. And I promised that if, if elected, I would vote for the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiated by President Obama because it would be good for our farmers and good for southern Minnesota. Now, most of the Democrats voted against him even having the authority to negotiate that. I asked Dan the other day in Otana, did he support that? Would he support that? But at large, I will go to Washington, sit on the Ag Committee, and do everything possible to expand trade and open markets for our farmers. Mr. Agador, thank you. And you have one minute, Mr. I think it's important to raise this point tonight if we don't get another chance to. Uh, what southern Minnesota is asking for right now is an independent voice in Washington. It's not beholden to party leaders or corporate special interests. And this is a perfect example of that issue. Because I've been clear, when I say a check and balance needs to come to Washington, that's the constitutional responsibility of the House of Representatives. The check and balance means working with President Trump when it benefits Minnesota. But it also means you stand up to him when it does not. And the idea right now that I believe is that you campaign how you want to govern. And if this trade war goes into another season and another season, the choice is clear on this. You're either going to have someone that will stand up for southern Minnesotan farmers or someone who will not. Okay. Well, we're seeing progress. The president's made progress with Mexico and Canada, which is very strong for us. Just today, he announced that we're going to have E15 all year round. That's good for farmers. I don't remember that happening during the last administration. Dan was a political appointee for President Obama. I don't remember it happening then. But the whole point is, before there was this so-called trade war that the Democrats want to talk about, Trump it, there was a war against agriculture. It was led by the Democrat Party and Barack Obama. Massive regulations like waters of the United States. Obamacare, which was devastating farmers in southern Minnesota, was the biggest issue in agriculture for five years. Energy policy, driving up the cost of farming needlessly. Forty percent of the cost of a bushel of corn to produce it is energy. When you drive up the price of energy, that doesn't do anybody any good. So I think farmers get it, that President Trump and Republicans have been trying to make gains in all those areas which are strong for farming, strong for small business, strong for southern Minnesota. And for that reason, I believe that the farmers will be with us, and I ask for their vote. How can women, immigrants, the poor, and those in the LGBTQ community effectively make their voices heard in this very divisive political climate? <laughs> well, in the end, we're all Americans. So if people uh, have needs, ideas, or whatever, stand up and shout and go for it. There are a lot, uh, we say you talk about the tax bill, he didn't like that, but there's been a lot of economic growth there in the last two years under President Trump's administration with the help of Republicans. Now, we have, we have record low unemployment in most of the communities that you just talked about. We have record startup businesses with women and others that uh, un unseen in a long, long, long time. Sometimes it's just record from uh, since they've been keeping statistics. So, I mean, the best way to empower people is to provide them opportunities to go out in the economy, work hard, save and invest, and be there. As far as everything else, yeah, of course, we're all for equality, we're all for equal rights, uh, but let's not turn it on its head and do what they did in Washington. You talk about divisiveness in Washington. You talk about problems in Washington with partisanship. I haven't seen so much partisanship in my life, except those, those Kavanaugh hearings for the Supreme Court. You know, he was, he was guilty until proven innocent. There was no due process there. Everybody you know, on one side believed somebody, everybody on the other side supposedly believed somebody else. But we can't, we can't destroy a person uh, in, in a situ situation like that, which was, I think, trumped up in many respects by the senators. I'm not talking about the person that came forward. I'm talking about the senators who were very overly partisan and divisive. And I'm pleased that Justice Kavanaugh is now on the Supreme Court because he's a strict constructionist who I believe will apply the Constitution fairly. Is he gay? He will apply the Constitution fairly in a way that uh, will benefit all Americans and uh, the way the forefathers, uh, the way the forefathers intended.
What I've learned from thousands of conversations on the campaign trail is that the world of 2018 is a place in which we have a great abundant resources, but we also believe, or are made to believe, that there's not enough to go around. And that goes for things like health care, it goes for wages, and it goes for just the sense of belonging, too. Because what happens when we're made to feel that there's not enough to go around, we are pitted against each other. And the groups just mentioned here are just some of the groups that feel pitted against when, the, when we feel that scarcity of resources. Because when we talk about Rochester, a city like this, where there's a lack of affordable housing, those tensions start to flare up. And different members of the community who are, happen to be either minorities, women, LGBTQ in particular, are made to feel less. My vision for not just Southern Minnesota, for, but for our country is the idea that either everyone matters or no one matters. And as long as any group is made to feel that they don't matter, then we have work to do. Because that statement, either everyone matters or no one matters, is as much about economic justice as it is about racial justice as it is about social justice. And the idea that there, this country that is abundant in resources, where the average CEO makes $19.4 million, is a place where everyone can feel empowered to live their best life freely. Okay, very good. Let's move on to the next topic. We have had many people in our audience tonight, as well as our questions that were emailed in. Uh, they want to know more about mental health care. What will you do to expand access to mental health care? Wait times to get help are often far too long, and people cannot get the help they need. And Dan Fian, if you could take this question first. Yes, absolutely. So this, this is a, a field and an experience that I've had through my time in the military, through my time in the Pentagon, as, as a field that has incredible need in this country. Uh, because we are a country that is increasingly isolated. And when a, when a people is isolated, the, the tendency of mental health uh, issues tends to increase along the way. And so this is a function of capacity too. And we have a, a field of mental health professionals that there is very little incentive to go into and, and a need that far exceeds the actual supply of people there. <coughs> Something I would want to do in concert with the absolute need to adjust and address student loan debt is to, to allow the idea of public service to be expanded. And if public service is the realm of work that you are getting into, then we should talk about student loan forgiveness. And a very specific need of public health is mental health. And if you are going into a mental health profession, I think you should be allowed to go into a program where we should consider your loans to be forgiven so that we have the actual amount of people who want to go into men the mental health profession allowed to do so without having to fear student loan debt or making enough to do it in the first place. Because when with that incentive is not there for people, then that need is only going to rise. And I say that as someone who has had to, because of my time in, in Iraq, look at mental health for my own self. And that, that challenge is very real for so many different Americans, and it's important to be able to address it without the stigma that comes along the way. The idea that you do need help every now and then to be able to deal with the stresses of your life, because they are many. All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I believe that we should definitely make sure that people aren't stigmatized and that people are promoting, you know, pushed to seek help and we do everything we can to comfort folks and have people in place and to, uh, to encourage as best as possible across the board. All of that is very important. I mean, I've, I've seen it uh, very close myself in my life. But, you know, we're, we're in Rochester, Minnesota. This is the home of the preeminent institution of medicine in all the world. Today there were probably hundreds of people traveling here, sometimes from all around the world, to receive the best medical care uh, on the planet. And, you know, Rochester, Mayo Clinic, uh, they kind of been hand in hand over this last 50 years. Well, Mayo Clinic used to have 5,000 employees, now they have about 35,000. Rochester used to have about 25,000 people, now they have 115, basically. Uh, you know, what's important for Rochester and Mayo are tied together. And this election is probably the first election in our lifetimes in which the concept of socialized medicine, Medicare for all, universal, whatever you want to call it, is on the ballot. Nobody would have ever thought that if the Democrat Party were to receive power, that they would actually implement something like that. And I hope we're going to get a chance to talk more about this because it's a very critical issue. I 100% oppose the concept of socialized medicine. You know, Obamacare, not a good thing. As bad as it is, you know, the Democrats want to take us to the next level. And that would have really devastating effects. The quality of medicine, innovation, jobs here, growth, 
and uh, I hope that we'll have a chance before the rest of this debate is concluded to address the concept of medical care and what we should do moving forward. Okay, one more minute to expand on this. I, I agree with Jim on that. I hope we get to talk more about health care. But the question is relates to, to mental health, and, and off that point, it's important to consider what going backwards in health care looks like. Because I'm not satisfied with the status quo in a place where people are paying far more than they should and have very few options to do so. And the health care that they have isn't comprehensive and usually doesn't include mental health care. But the idea of going backwards to a place where pre-existing conditions would not be covered invites the idea that someone with a mental health issue would not be covered in the first place. It invites that idea. And that is not something, that is not a going backwards that we can afford as a country. Because the reality is this, here in southern Minnesota, I have a childhood friend I grew up with in Red Wing. He had to, had to seek treatment, very serious treatment for a mental health issue. There was not a, a, a bed close enough to take him. The closest bed for him was in North Dakota. So back to the point of law enforcement, a police officer had to, tra had to transport him to North Dakota to take care of that. If that is not a broken system, that is not that is underfunded, then I don't know what is. Mr. Hector. For Minnesotans, for Minnesotans, the only going backward that we've had in the last 10 years is Obama. Minnesota, Minnesota did not need Obama. Minnesotans were 94% covered before Obamacare with a mechanism in place for people with pre-existing and expensive medical needs. All Obamacare did is come in and disrupt the markets, dumb down our care, and force people to pay sometimes twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year for, with premiums and deductibles so high the underlying insurance is worthless. But as bad as that is, moving forward to where we have government-run health care, where the government decides the reimbursements. I mean, how in the world can any model of uh, hospital doctors, particularly the Mayo Clinic, function on 50 cents on the dollar? They won't. What about when you deny people to come into the system from outside? That's what every other country has done when they've had socialized medicine, Canada, Germany, Great Britain. It would devastate us. It would put 40,000 or more jobs at risk. It would destroy the building and progress that's going on, including the building that they're going to put on top of the Mayo Clinic. So for that and other reasons, I oppose it, and I, I, I support free market health. I think we're running out of time. We're going to move into the speed round. We'll ask you a question. You'll have one minute to respond. There will be no rebuttal. We got a, this question from multiple people. What is one positive idea from your opponent that you could use in your campaign? Shut up. What is one positive idea from your opponent that you could use in your campaign? Well, the concept of service. I like the fact that you went around the district and met with people and helped them out. I thought that was nice. Uh, uh, Jim Hagedorn is unstoppable in a parade. <laughs> <laughs> What is your view of frack sand mining, Mr. Fian? Yes, absolutely. So this is an issue that relates to southern Minnesota. I am opposed to the idea in general, but I believe more important than that, that local, what impacts you most locally is who should make that decision at the end of the day. Which is why I believe a county like Winona County should be empowered to decide what types of industries come into it. Because the byproduct of that, the beauty of the Mississippi River in particular, is something that they have to live with for the rest of it. So that empowerment at the local level is the approach that I would take with it. Roxanne, my name is Mr. If the locality decides to ban it, then it's going to be someplace else that's probably going to supply it. But, uh, uh, so you know, local control is fine. Thanks. What are you going to do to reduce the deficit? The deficit, not the debt. The debt's 21 trillion, the deficit. I'll give you one idea that I don't think anybody's ever heard of. Federal employees in Washington, believe it or not, receive free transportation to and from work. Their subway cards, their parking, things like that. You pay for it. It's ridiculous, $3,000 a year. Let's get rid of that and let the federal employees pay their own way. That would save about half a billion dollars. What I'm worried about uh, as a country, uh, and a lot, not a lot of people know this, if you in the, in the crowd know this, I, my, my hat's off to you and I, I applaud you. Uh, the war in Afghanistan just turned 17 years old. 17 years old. And meanwhile, we lost a service member last week, a 23 year old, meaning on 9-11-2001, they were six years old. We're at a place, if we ended the war on terror today, which, which we can, the total cost of it from front end to the end of care for every veteran along the way would be $5 trillion. 
That is a war that is continuing in perpetuity because Congress authorized it. And Congress has the ability to evaluate very harshly whether that war needs to continue in perpetuity at such an enormous cost. And not just, this isn't just about money. This is about the blood and treasure of the United States, our sons and daughters. Also, we deal with this crisis? Crisis destigmatize and we'll start with you, Mr. Flynn. Absolutely. It, as, as with any addiction, the best possible care that you can provide is preventative. It's to talk with our children. I'm a, I'm a former middle school teacher. There's no reason we shouldn't be talking with our kids about the challenges of drugs that aren't from 30 years ago, but are right here and now in our communities. And that preventative care takes away the stigma and idea. Because at the end of the day, no matter what a government does or does not do, does not do it is peers. Peer pressure for the better, peer pressure for the worse that makes or breaks lives in this world, and especially with addictive drugs. Mr. Hagerman? You know, unfortunately, most of, the, most of the problems, most of the deaths, the severe problems are because of the misuse of fentanyl patches and things like that. Uh, drug abuse is, is a problem. It's destroying families, it's destroying people. It's really putting our communities at, uh, under pressure. And so uh, I grew up uh, in the 80s, uh, you know, with Nancy Reagan saying, just say no, I believe in that. Maybe some people think that's too simplistic, but that's where it starts. And after that, uh, to make sure that the medical community and others, that they communicate, to make sure that we know how many of these things, these pills are being uh, put out there and so forth. And, and so I think communication and to make sure that we just encourage people uh, to, to stay away from illegal drug use. Thank you. One more question. How long have we been in this district? An audience member tonight would like to know what can we do to stop school shootings? And Mr. Hagedorn, if you could take this first. Well, I mean, there's lots of things that they can do at the local level that I would encourage. Uh, local, that always have the authority at the local level to determine whether they harden the schools and do some things. Uh, security, we've seen that, uh, where they lock, have doors locked and things of that nature. I also believe that in the end, uh, the school districts, the school boards, and others should have the authority to determine whether they have a police officer on site, maybe it could be a retired veteran or somebody else, or somebody with a weapon who's been trained uh, to be there to try to cut a shooting, uh, you know, cut that short. Uh, in, in the end, usually uh, when a bad guy uh, who's probably uh, you know, going to do things unlawfully and show up no matter what law you have, uh, the way to cut that short is with a good guy with a, with a weapon who's usually properly trained in those types of things. So I would leave it up to the local communities and the schools. Uh, to make those determinations. At, at one point in my life, I was armed, and at one point in my life, I was a teacher. Thank God that was not at the same time. The most important thing we can do to address all forms of gun violence, which includes school shootings, which includes the deaths that are byproduct of poverty, which includes mass shootings, and which includes the biggest bulk of them, which is gun violence and gun deaths by suicide, is to actually fund research, not just talk about it, but fund research through the Center for Disease Control so that we can have evidence-based policy making to address the statements and we'll begin with you. Well, I want to thank uh, KTC, uh, KTTC again uh, for putting this on tonight and for the audience members to, to brave in the rain to be here as well. Uh, I hope what you saw and heard was a contrast tonight and that's just not on, on matters of substance but I hope you saw one in, in a, a matter of uh, a style as well. I believe that the biggest challenge facing our Congress right now is a lack of bipartisanship and I'll be very clear I've worked with a lot of Jim Hagedorns in my life people that are focused on disagreeing, people that go to the lowest common denominator, and people that are not willing to work with the other side. Washington, D.C. is broken because it is full of Jim Hagedorns right now, plain and simple. I am running to be an independent voice because I don't take corporate PAC money, and I am not beholden to any party leader. What Southern Minnesota needs and has always needed is an independent voice that represents the people first, not a corporation, not a party leader, and can represent their interests in Washington. Look, this is a humbling task. Jim and I both know what we're going through is, is a heck of an experience along the way, but we do so with you at heart, and so I want to make sure that that is clear. Because look, folks, uh, public service can be politics. Politics can be public service. But if you don't believe that, then maybe you haven't found the right candidate for you. But what we've tried to represent is that idea that people come first, that our politics is public service. 
And that is the only way to do that is to actually embody it and represent yourself. And I've had a chance to do that in a lot of different ways as a soldier, as a teacher, as part of the Pentagon, and I hope to be so as your next representative in Congress. So I humbly ask for your support. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks to you, Tom, and KTTC, and everyone. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, and say uh, hi and thank you to Jennifer uh, Carnahan, my fiance, for being here, and the whole team and all of you for, for showing up for the debate. Um, you know, where, where we are in this country is uh, we're at a crossroad. You know, in 2016, I, I said that if Donald Trump hadn't won, I, for many ways, we would have lost the country. We were just going to stack that to uh, the and take away our basic rights. That's what I believe. So I think we're still in the same spot. We're either going to go to the left, we're going to go to the right. And this particular race for Congress actually could decide it. It could be that close. It could be the one seat that moves us one way or the other. Now, during this debate and over the course of the campaigns that I've run in this district, I've done my very level best to get out and meet with you personally, to engage with you personally, and to let you know exactly where I stand on the issues and what I would do with the job if you were so kind to elect me, and I'd be humbled to have the opportunity. And, uh, you know, right now, what I'd say is I want to partner with the president, I want to keep moving the country in the right direction, keep America safe with secure borders and a military peace through strength. Make sure that we keep the economy rolling by reforming government, regulations, taxes, welfare, and energy. Protect our God-given rights, the right to life, the right to keep and bear arms, right to religious freedom and to do everything we can to sustain agriculture and rural way of life. You know, I'm from the farm, it's personal for me. I serve on the Agriculture Committee to get that done. I think during this debate tonight, I've offered those solutions to you, given you my positions and the issues. I humbly ask for your vote and, uh, and your prayers. Thank you. gentlemen here on stage, Jim Hagedorn, thank you for joining us tonight, and Dan Fee. Can we give them a round? Woo!